Good evening, everybody. It's um, a great, uh, as ever, it's always a great uh, pleasure and privilege to be talking to the members of the Western Front Association. And so, um, as it says, tonight I'm going to be looking um, at official war photography and the effect that has on uh, public perceptions of uh, the war. And if I, if I get a bit of time, you know, perhaps the end to talk about the lasting legacies, how it's come down to us. So um, to kick things off, you know, I think what we really need to do, um, let me just shunt things on, there we go, um, is, is to say, you know, that by 1914, clearly what we have is a society that is very photo literate. It's got used to seeing photographs um, in the press um, and indeed um, what had been the uh, large circulation 19th century illustrated uh, papers like the Illustrated London News, you know, Sphere Graphic, they are using photographs a lot more by um, the Edwardian period, you know, as exemplified here um, uh, by the great Ponting, you know, when um, Scott's expedition to, to the South Pole. You know, were uh, an incredibly um, wonderful photographer. Um, it's very much part of Scott's ideas um, for how the um, expedition will be publicised. Obviously, it also means that a message from the sponsors can be got back. It's amazing how many times, you know, Ponting made sure that crates of Heinz beans um, were on display or Huntley and Palmer um, biscuits. So the idea of, of visual literacy, you know, of seeing um, and of seeing photographs um, as opposed to uh, other forms of illustration like paintings or engraving was uh, very much part of that Edwardian world, that world that's going to go in to um, the war. And that final element, which is, uh, of course, crucial, is the idea that the photograph um, is indexical, you know, that you are seeing reality, you are seeing the truth. Um, and given the conditions of uh, the war, you know, a, a mass war of um, total uh, mobilization of societies, the need to understand what everybody was working towards, you know, that, that final ultimate victory, the need to understand the landscape in which um, friends and loved ones might be risking their lives is, um, is, is you know, real and palpable throughout the war. So photography is gonna end up um, as one of the, the great solvents, you know, along with cinematography, Along with film, it's going to be the way in which people are taken to the front. Um, and in turn, I think that then opens up that whole um, question, you know, that ancient hoary old question, um, which was the cliche about the home front until about 20 odd years ago when um, so much new work started to come in, which was, you know, people on the home front didn't understand what the front was like. They didn't understand the realities of battle. Well, I think tonight by looking at some of these photographers, you know, we, we can start to um, uh, think about that from a different angle. So if we're going to look at uh, photography during the war, let's have a quick list about the, the, the names of the, the major players that we're, we're thinking about here. Um, so Ernest Brooks is um, uh, a pre-war photographer for the Daily Mirror, and he's going to end up working um, on um, official uh, photographic projects for both the Canadian and the British government. Ditto with Ivor Castle. Notice another one for the Daily Mirror. Um, the Daily Mirror prior to um, the Great War is uh, the mass circulation daily newspaper which goes most enthusiastically for photographic spreads. You know, often on the front page, often um, there might be a full front page photograph, particularly if a dramatic or newsworthy incident had occurred, something like a coronation, you know, state opening of parliament, there'll be a full photograph. Um, often uh, central page spreads, 
and uh, the back page. So that old cliche, you know, of a photo telling a thousand words um, and immediately arresting a viewer's attention is certainly one that the Daily Mirror has picked up on. You know, and the Daily Mirror at this point is, shall we say, a lower middle class to the, the kind of respectable top end of the working class daily um, circulation paper. So that one which is trying, shall we say, to grab the busy man and woman who perhaps isn't an elite daily paper reader because that that person really hasn't the time you know to sit down over breakfast and read a full gone broadsheet but wants um to be informed but also to have that kind of emotional arrest of of the power of a photograph so we see two um uh, very important photographers there brooks and castle uh frank hurley who, who you see there um of course i'm sure a lot of people um know about frank hurley the australian uh, photographer who had made an, a name for himself before the the war um, and is going to be stuck at the start of the war um, in um, Antarctica, you know, at, at South, um, first of all, on the, the Antarctic Peninsula uh, with the Shackleton expedition. Um, and then, you know, they're all going to be on uh, Whale Island before they're rescued and get back to South Georgia. And as soon as he is repatriated, you know, he'll go off um, and become an official photographer at the front. Um, uh, G.P. Lewis, who's the who becomes the official home front photographer in 1917. Um, Horace Nichols, who also does a lot of um, home front work. He's a specialist in sports photography you know, and as you can see they've worked for the Tatler and the Illustrated London News. The great William Ryder Ryder again notice Daily Mirror um, and John Warwick Brook um, uh, of the uh, Topical Press Agency. So a, a photographer that was used to his work being syndicated um, across mo multiple titles. So you can see there you know that um, uh, Photography is serious business during the war, as I'm sure a lot of you know, in the early part of the war where British censorship policy is all over the place, uh, photographers and cinematographers get themselves off to the front, they are following um, events right up close. Um, the, it really is as stasis comes to the Western Front and, and the army settle down, you know, that the great bureaucratic machine of the army can then begin to repatriate photographers because um, Kitchener uh, in particular, who uh, felt that he'd got on the wrong side of the press or the wrong side of press interpretations during the South African War, is very, very keen as Secretary of State for War to control um, both the written and the visual image. So, we, we lose an official record, um, even a commercial you know, record in 1915. And it's only during the course of 1915, as very, very slowly, um, the British and Dominion governments work their way towards a more sophisticated communication policy that photographers are gonna be licensed again, um, you know, and will go out uh, to the front working um, uh, ostensibly as official photographers. Now, one of the first to get a real grip on this, uh, and we might call you know, the great impresario is, is Sir Max Aitken, um, Lord Beaverbrook. Um, you know, as a man who, who you might say is, is a true representative of the Britannic world of the first part of the 20th century. You know, a man who saw no contradiction at all in being a great Canadian and a great Britain, because they are essentially one and the same things. It's just kind of different parts of the same family. So the man who had made a name for himself in business um, and uh, in Canadian politics, but then also establishes himself in London to establish himself in, in British business and, and British politics. And in um, uh, 1914, um, places his energy, um, his ambition um, at the service of uh, the Canadian state. And he's very quickly on to the idea, you know, as a man who's going to move, as we know, into newspaper ownership through the Daily Express and its stable of newspapers, that ensuring that the ordinary person on the street back home understood the nature of the war and was brought in to you know an, an understanding was kind of um was treated as an adult these are the realities 
of the front. This is what we are fighting for. This is what we are fighting against. He realizes that the visual image is crucial to that. Now, as you can see in that letter to the Canadian Prime Minister, um, under modern conditions, nations are fighting and are sacrificing bone and sinew to an extent never known before. And realization alone can justify the sacrifice. We must see our men climbing out of the trenches to the assault before we can realize the patience, the exhaustion and the courage, which are the assets and trials of the modern fighting man. So uh, Aitken shoves a lot of cash, um, a lot of energy, um, and uh, we might also say a lot of um, uh, dictatorial uh, power into the creation of a Canadian War Records Office, um, a body which uh, essentially has got a, a dual function. It's for the here and now, you know, telling Canadian people why Canada is in the war, what its um, uh, men are doing, and also to build up a historical legacy for Canada, you know, so future generations can understand what Canada has um, contributed. And of course, the, the other um, really important strand of that is the huge amount of money he's going to sink into the Canadian War Artists Fund, which he will then bring to the British, you know, with, with the establishment in 1916 of a British War Artists scheme. And as I'm sure you've all seen in the Imperial War Museum, you know, the, the amazing um, uh, collection of art that that's going to generate. So um, with Borden being brought on board with Aitken's uh, connections in London and busy digging himself into Fleet Street. He's one of the first to mobilise um, photographers uh, on a basis you know, where basically he, he's kind of sharing them with the British press, saying what they do out there um, will be sped through censorship because it's being done under my name, you know, and, and the Canadian War Records Office name. That means you can put it into your newspapers um, uh, as well. Um, and so, you know, you're getting a good deal. Um, we're getting a good deal. And as Aiken is very well aware from what he's picked up from Kitchener, who tends to be a lot more kind of tight lipped and buttoned up about the way propaganda um, is, is going to be managed. As the independent Canadian War Records Office agency, he says, well, essentially, you know, Canada's understanding of censorship is at play here, not the British War Office. So if we pass things as OK for publication, you know, that's it. So um, the Canadian War Records Office, it's got an office in London and also um, in, in Ottawa, you know, is often leading the way. It's getting stuff through its own censorship programmes really quickly. It's distributing photographs. And you increasingly see, you know, um, sections of the British press saying that the British Army, you know, we've, we've got to catch up here. We've got to move um, as quickly as uh, the Canadians. So you see, Canada will lead um, the way with... Um, war photographic exhibitions and by um by the middle of the war is exhibiting them first in london and then we'll ship them over to uh, canada and of course crucially the usa the neutral usa is going to be wooed in um by these um exhibitions uh and indeed so successful um are they particularly in um america that uh, Cecil Spring Rice, you know, the British ambassador in Washington, is going to write um, home to, to the British government to say, um, you know, we, we've got to catch up with foregone official British photography because the word is going round here in the USA that basically Canada, you know, is fighting Britain's war for it. Canada is taking the bulk of it. So that's kind of how powerful, how um, the, the impact of seeing um, these photographs is. Now, they, they do get um, huge, um, huge, huge viewing figures. We can look at that in, in a bit more detail in a moment. But you can see the Grafton Galleries um, just off Bond Street will end up um, as, a, as a gallery that had very quickly um, started to specialise in photographic exhibitions as well as our uh, um, paintings and, and drawings will often be the, the lead uh, place for this. And then they will often make um, as well um, 
uh, provincial tours. You know, they will go around British cities. So there you see um, the Royal Scottish Academy, the City Art Gallery um, in Leeds. Um, and so say that they make um, big circuits. As you might imagine, you know, um, down in this neck of the woods where, where I am, thanks to the uh, huge size of the Canadian camp at Shorncliffe, um, just outside Folkestone, um, Folkestone, uh, city, uh, Folkestone uh, Mayor uh, and the, the Town Council is really, really keen to get hold of the ex exhibition. And when it comes to Folkestone, huge numbers of people um, turn out because, um, uh, of course, they're, they're really used to the Canadian presence. Um, it's become part of their daily existence um, of, of the war. Um, so there you can see the um, the list of the, the major um, exhibitions um, and you can see say how Canada is way ahead of it um, as, as the Battle of the Somme you know it peters out um, they're they're making that statement in the winter of 1916 with their first form exhibition then there's another one in June 17 obviously an excellent moment for a second follow-up one because there's the success of Vimy Ridge um, uh, to trumpet there and it's going to overlap of course with the success of the Messines Ridge offensive as well so again it's kind of sparks people's um, re-engage uh, people's interest um, in uh, the war the Australians are going to get in um, as you can see with a long-running exhibition starting in um, the spring of 1918 and it's going to coincide you know with with the drama on the western front of, of the great german spring offensive and then the counter offensive and um the, the british will also have their dramatic moment you know when those battles in those defensive battles in france are at their highest in that spring of uh, 1918 and you know, that, that spring moment of 1918, when the war seems so much in the balance um, on the Western Front, um, kind of reignites interest in the war. War weariness, you know, people might be a bit sick of it and a bit knackered, but they're suddenly thinking, um, you know, my God, you know, we, we, we have to cling on in here. We have to see this thing through um and so there's a there's a renewed surge of, of interest in what's going on at the front and so there are huge um like huge huge crowds for these um exhibitions all the way through to the end of the war now one of the ways in which that is um uh, established one of the ways in which you put out the word about the um uh the, the importance of these uh images is of course to achieve the patronage of the great and the good so getting someone like the prince of wales to to show up to uh the previews um is really really important you know the royal family as we know throughout the war set uh set the tone in an amazingly important way you know and the things which they patronize the things which they show by their presence they regard as important um definitely has an effect upon the the wider population so there you can see that the, the prince of wales um uh, at uh, a canadian war um, photograph exhibition there's Ivor Castle, the photographer with uh, Queen Mary and the Prince of Wales, giving them a, a personal look round. Um, and we'll come back to the, the scale of the photographs in a moment. But you can see they are massive. You know, they're on full um, Uccello route of San Romano size, you know, which will become, for those of you that have seen that in the National Gallery, as I'm sure you'll also know, that becomes the standard size for the great war art uh, painting um, uh, canvases as well. It's that that um, Uccello size. Now, how for those um, that, that don't see it, you know, how are they? Um, how are they finding out um, about these um, exhibitions? Well, of course, it is through the press, you know, the press create a um, uh, a, a kind of merry-go-round of interest, the circle of interest. The photographs are appearing in the press. The press then tell you there is now a collected exhibition of these photographs. Get yourself down there to, to see them. There you'll see Daily Mail talking about um, the, the, the new Canadian War Photographs exhibition um, in the early summer of uh, 1917. So they're often picking up on uh, the, the highlights. Um, 
And what this is doing uh, as well, um, and, and particularly the photographers, the great photographers, and those who are writing the catalogues, you know, those who are backing up in words, the um, propagandistic um, nature of uh, these images, the thing they can play upon is that it connects soldiers with civilians. You know, soldiers like to go to see um, uh, these exhibitions when they're home on leave. There is a very, very big khaki footfall um, at the exhibitions. And obviously, then that creates um, the, the ideal press spin, you know, that the soldier authenticates it by being there. You know, the, the soldier is saying, you know, uh, just by me being here, I'm kind of showing you that this is important and that I agree with this. This is a realistic um, record. This is what it's like for me. And so the civilian and the soldier come together, the home front and the fighting front come together through the photograph being exhibited in a public space so that you can um, put your faith in this photograph. You know, you are seeing the reality of war um, and that and that's really potent for all um, age groups and groupings within society so we do see um, parties of school children being uh, taken in to see the photographs that's a very big part of it you know to get home that idea that there is um, uh, that there is a um, uh, you, you have the world of the Western Front and then later other fronts as well will be bought, um, bought to you. You will understand what your dad, what your older brother, your uncle is going through. Um, and we will make sure as well, you know, for that, those kids of an impressionable age uh, there. The idea, obviously, of legacy, what we would now call legacy, um, is, is inbuilt. You know, that these are things that when you're at an impressionable age might stick with you all your life. You know, the, these images will stick in um, the mind's eye. So we do have um, uh, huge um, numbers pour through. As I said, there you can see um, uh, people at the Grafton uh, Galleries, at the Canadian uh, War Photography Exhibition um, coming through the main galleries, often sitting down, um, you know, just as you would uh, at an art gallery to look um, at, at the big canvases and you can see that central bench if you look to the right you can see one of the huge supersize images is on the wall directly behind the uh, little union jack covered desk there so people are kind of drinking in the scale of of that image and also uh, you know by cramming so many in the kaleidoscopic effect of the hanging decisions you know that people are seeing are given the, the, the chance to see scenes behind the line uh, you know scenes of, of like the guns and the limbers and the munitions going up and the wounded coming back and and, and things like that, as well as um uh, captured ground you know the reality of trenches so there's this sense of the whole of the front being um, explored and obviously when you show off things like um, ammunition columns at work you know and guns and limbers going forward just like in the Battle of the Somme film what's really important there is the home front is shown what it is doing you know every time you see a dump of shells that's there for for the munitionettes you know that that is saying to them look that's what you've done right Whatever, you know, you might just think of it as a, as a dull routine thing that you do at your bench, workbench every day in the factory. But there it is at the front, about to go up to the gun line you know, to, to um, protect our men when they um, are, are fighting for your safety back home. So I think these kaleidoscopic effects were really important for, for giving that um, overall um, understanding of, of what the, the world the other side of the channel is like. Um, and there you see it again, where there is um, the mix, you, you can see the, the photograph of the guys in um, uh, the bus, you know, and the lorry going up to the front, cheering the ones in, in the front line um, itself. So these kind of narratives um, of the war are created in that top long picture, you know, of, of the, um, the grand panorama of um, 
no man's land with troops and, and, and trees, uh, the, the skeletal trees uh, dotting it. So we, we get this multi-textured, almost like a, a, a tapestry uh, effect is, is created by the hangings. But obviously at, at the heart of all of this is um, you know, the sheer incredible um, solar plexus hitting drama of the supersized images. I mean, look at these things, you know, that they're, they're, they're four, five, six meters high, 10, 15 meters wide. So, um, you know, they're, they're quite difficult to, and quite expensive to produce because obviously um, what uh, tends to be, happening, they're almost created like um, advertising posters, you know, on great billboards, um, that they come in strips um, a lot of the time and have to be kind of glued uh, together as section after section is printed and have to be carefully put together to create the overall effect. But, um, you know, to get that, you, you know, the, the depth, um, for the eye to contemplate that you know you have to stand back on that and as you walk towards it obviously it, you your, the eye will become lost um in the detail and it will almost become uh, dizzying as as you move towards uh, an image like that you know like sitting in uh, the very front row of a, of a very large screen um cinema but th these are the stars of the show right that's what brings it really home to people particularly when they are big front line scenes, you know, of troops um, in, in the trenches um, uh, with, with bombardments going on um, and, and stuff like that. that that's what the, the public really wants to see. Um, and there you see one of Frank Hurley's ones and you get a sense of the massive scale of this. It is um, uh, a cinema sized um, uh, power um, of, of the effect that, that you're um, getting here. Now, as I mentioned, they are huge successes. They are huge successes in London. They are huge successes when they go out on provincial tours. Leeds City Art Galleries has a very, very um, uh, successful um, uh, exhibition. And um, that, that's clearly a pose, you know, um, propaganda photograph. There is one to prove the point that the fighting soldier recognises this as reality um, and endorses it. Um, so you as a civilian should come along. I mean, that's obviously a very, very well posed photograph. And, and it also shows us something about the um, uh, realities of war. You can see the tuppence tax there, the entertainment tax that had been brought in at the end of 1916 that was going to make cinema going and all forms of, of entertainments that little bit more um, uh, expensive. So it's a really interesting photograph there. But um, I say, although that one is is very definitely posed and it helps create the, the record of the effects of these, um, it is by no means um, you know a, a complete myth. Um, uh, soldiers do like to, to see these. Um, and there you go, another one. Um, uh, advertising the lead city art galleries and 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 there you have it don't you like it in block capitals see the war um in colored photographs um and aid war charities at the the city art gallery seeing seeing is believing so um multiple ways of engaging with the photographs you know you didn't have to be a londoner um you could see these across britain just as indeed you can see them across uh, canada um and uh, australia um and even if you miss them you know you are going to end up seeing them in the newspapers and we'll look at newspaper representation um in a moment now what are these let, let, let's think about some of the iconic photographs you know some of the, the top end um of um of this work well we do get uh, moments like this don't we uh, john warwick brook the moment of the attack um captured with, with the cameronians going over the top there now we can get round to reality effects in a moment and the ability to manipulate uh, an image which is a, a whole um another thing but you know th this photograph is powerful for us today right uh, I mean, so Lord alone knows what the effect is in 1917 of seeing something like this, you know, of, of men seemingly going into the heat of 
battle, you know, just as that fate song sequence of men clambering out of their trenches. Um, wh whether it's faked or not is almost immaterial. You know, the, the home front thought reality was coming home to them. They, they thought this is what it was like. Um, and it filled them with both admiration and horror. They were getting something of, of the reality of war. And, and we see it here, don't we, in something like Frank Hurley's scene near, near Burr Crossroads on, on the Menin Road in September 1917. The non-denial of war's effect. War creates casualties. The home front knows this, right? It's known this um, uh, really, um, uh, really um, powerfully since uh, July 1916, as the Somme casualty lists have been printed day in, day out in the newspapers. The columns of the dead and the wounded are there. So people know what the reality is, and here they begin to see it. Of course, what they are still seeing, although they're, you know, they're seeing the reality of war, war creates um, casualties. War does things like smashes um, ambulances and lorries off the road so they can't be used anymore. Um, so you get that reality. But of course, Hurley is also doing the reality that he's allowed to present, which is basically, you know, as, as Siegfried Sassoon would have it in his poem, shall we say, decently wounded men. There are no limbs hanging off there. There are no guts hanging out. You know, there are no decapitations, anything like that. It, it's it's men um, that, that, you know, in, in one instance, you're know, able to drag himself up on his stretcher to look round, to look at the camera. So there is still a controlled reality here, but nonetheless, this is what war does. Um, it, it's there for people to see. And, you know, for that whole idea, what people don't really get the desolation of the front um you know oh yes they do um the panorama of Passchendaele that William Ryder Ryder um produces there is the slough of despond there it is and what we see here is a perfect example you know of of um of uh, the creation of propaganda you know and what you might say is the most sophisticated way of creating propaganda that you have to have reality in it you know for propaganda to work and for, to keep people on board for an extended period of time it must be based in something that is true something you know that's biteable like a coin it's then what you do with it right um depending on shall we say how moral your government is, how much of a moral compass it's got. Now, here, in showing people what the Passchendaele battlefield is like, the reality of it, of course, the spin that you put upon it is, and this is the landscape, that our men are enduring, are suffering in, in order to keep you free and to keep you safe. So you show something of the reality, but then, you know, put your own value judgment on it. And, and that's going to be used, you know, for the paintings as well. So, you know, if you think of something like Singer Sergeant's Gast, showing you the full horror of gas warfare, you know, that amazingly powerful painting. Why is that created? What's that there for? Well, as Lloyd George and co say, that is there so that future generations as well will know what British soldiers, British and Imperial soldiers suffered to buy freedom and safety. So the spin on what you see, the interpretation on what you see is important. And we do get this, this posing of reality. So Frank Hurley clearly does it here at Chateau Wood. I mean, there's this amazing, uh, powerful photograph, you know, where, where his soldiers stand up um, uh, like those shattered skeletal sentinel trees, they become part of the, the, the weird, mad ver um, verticals of um, uh, the Western Front. And he's very clearly posed them on that duck board, hasn't he, to make sure that he gets the scale against the trees, um, uh, that the horizon lines work. So, you know, this is a master photographer at work with the eye of, of an artist. Um, but here, is the world, say, in, in which men um, endure. And remember, 
for a, a Britannic world, an Anglophone world, which is dominated um, in its culture by images of Bunyan and the Pilgrim's Progress. Um, and that idea, you know, um, that, that Protestant version of suffering in order to achieve, to reach the celestial city, that it's all embedded, encoded in these um, photographs. Here is the slough of despond, you know, which Christian pilgrim has to traverse in order to achieve the great victory of, of righteousness. Um, similarly, you know, John Warwick Brook here, um, stretcher bearers, he's obviously waited for his moment there. He's obviously got um, he, his reality posed. But, um, you know, hell's bells, that's, that's Passchendaele, isn't it? That, oh, that's third eat. That, that is that soaking summer of 19. Uh, 17. Um, but it's also um, showing the endeavours you know, of comrades to rescue their fellow Tommy. You know, how little they will stop. No matter what it costs them, they are going to drag someone out of that. They are going to get them back. They are going to move them to um, safety. So the, the, these photographs are, are great, um, uh, fascinating narrative devices um, and we also see the sublime beauty of uh, the art of war photography um, here. Again, Hurley absolutely posing that, beautifully posing that. Um, getting that. There, there is the world of the deluge, isn't it? The, the world that would have to be cleansed by a second great deluge. I, mean, you know, I think for a world that was much more attuned to its biblical imagery than perhaps we are uh, um, today, um, uh, that's just under the surface of that. And, and literally the myriad faces of war, the reflections of war that, that Hurley brings us in, in this um, absolutely beautiful uh, photograph here, but, but showing the... Um, the misery of um, the battlefields of the third battle of uh, Ypres. Uh, and this stunner by Ernest Brooks, troops moving up at eventide. And, and notice that that diction, um, eventide. There it is, there's the Anglican hymnal, is the, the even song. Um, uh, th th this is the world of abide with me fast falls the even tide um so there is a poetry in the war photography as well and the the sun breaking through the dark clouds almost as if it's you know easter day that there is the darkness that comes with the moment of sacrifice uh, or the preparation for sacrifice but the inevitable triumph that will come from it as well for those that do good and suffer in the name of good and 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 this silhouetted army so you can't recognize anyone so it is an army of unknown warriors it is every man every man of the british empire at war doing their duty and they're doing it for you and don't you ever forget it you know that the, the kind of onus almost that it puts on the home front and future generations to be worthy of what is being done um for them so so the, the, this this the beauty of, of this uh, war photography now when we want to see tricks um a lot of this is being done with, with trick photography you know it's composite images it's laying of one image on top of another, negatives are, are mucked around with, are, are doctored very cleverly here. So Ivor Castle is doing it um, in his taking of Vimy Ridge. He's laying one upon the other. Um, he's got uh, shell bursts from a different um, uh, image that he's taken. And these are in fact, um, sort of really reserve troops coming up after the first wave of battle, you know, really after the Germans have been shoved back a fair way and he's making it seem like that the, the heart of battle you know that it's all about to to unfold um uh, but we can you know go into the justifications for the composites in a minute it certainly creates the drama um that he's looking 
for. Uh, as I'm sure a lot of you know, you know, ones like this, um, it's uh, Ivor Castle's shot of men going into action uh, at Vimy Ridge that is taken behind the lines on, on, on a training um, exercise. And he uses it as if it's the actual um, assault. So there is a manipulation of reality. Where we're going to see um, uh, this um, debate play out and, and play out in, in a really quite passionate way um, is uh, between um, C.E.W. Bean and Frank Hurley. Now, uh, as we all know, Bean is the official Australian recorder and historian, and he is bringing, you know, an absolute obsessive eye to this, that he wants absolute documentary reality of what Australia is contributing to this great war. And in his kind of rather dour, um, uh, shall we say, uh, methodologically obsessed um, uh, approach, which ironically, as we all know, um, for all his sense of being a detachment, you know, a detached historian who is dispassionately collecting his evidence so he can therefore say hand on heart, you know, this is the authentic record. Um, as we all know, Bean will actually turn that into a highly impassioned kind of doctored history of, of Australia at war. So he doesn't see the kind of contradiction in his own soul. But the per but because of his methodological approach, you know, the person that he's um, at loggerheads with really is Hurley, because he realizes that Hurley is creating composite images. You know, Hurley is mucking around. He's using all of his skills as a great photographer to create the overall effect that he wants. So Bean, you know, says to Hurley, cut that out, son. This, this isn't what we want. Hurley chucks it back at him with a really fascinating point um, about the nature of modern war, about the nature of the technology that he's got. Uh, you know, we, we all know um, that, that one of the big problems, you know, that's often said, isn't it, about mod the modern battlefield, the battlefield that kind of emerges from the 1860s onwards, is that, that often, in fact, it, it kind of lacks drama. It, it, as, as the big guns become more and more important, um, it becomes empty. You know, it, it seems at any one time as if it's only a few blokes moving, you know, somewhere in and they go in and out of smoke and they disappear and you don't know what you're meant to look at. And, and it does lack an overall kind of narrative framework and drama. So, uh, so Hurley says to Bean, look, this has been my problem, right? I go out there, I pretty much, you know, I do risk my neck. I take images and none of it truly captures what I'm seeing, what I'm hearing, um, you know, what, what I see, uh, what the blokes say to me when they come back. I can't get that in one image. He says, whereas I can get it if I put images together. So it's a really interesting debate that the two of them are having. So, you know, for Bean, he doesn't understand it. He thinks this is um, uh, manufacturing. He thinks this is cheating, that it's faking. Hurley says, you know, like any great artist, like Michelangelo, you know, art is lies in order to tell the truth. You know, art is a construction. It is something that's put together in order to reveal an immediate or greater truth. And the two of them are, 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 are clashing quite um, regularly. So this is what... Um, you know, Hurley is doing, um, he shoves lots of images together to create um, th this raid one, this which is, is used as a supersized image. Um, and, you know, it, it, it does now, doesn't it? It almost like has the drama of, of uh, an interwar film. This could be Dawn Patrol or something, couldn't it? Where's Basil Rathbone when, when you need him, leaning over the cockpit? Um, but Hurley says, I'm getting to the heart of battle here. I'm getting to the heart of the experience by doing this kind of stuff. Um, and you can see here what he does, you know, with one image, he reverses it. He puts the shell explosion, which almost has that sense, doesn't it, of a, of a body being flung up 
into the air, almost into a kind of sacrificial crucifixion pose, and then kind of drifting into something that's spectre-like or, or, or ghostly and being atomized. I mean, I always think, you know, that that's why you have the men in gate, really, isn't it? You know, that, that, that image is almost like the fragility of the human body being atomized and then the corpses in front. So there's Hurley using all of his skill and power to, to create something that, that's more um, dramatic. But say, according to him, is capturing the true reality of battle. He does it here at Zonnebecker. You can see um, he gets a, a very fine um, uh, 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 evening shot there with, with the light beginning to fade and the deeper clouds banking up. And then by the time he's overlaid his images, so you get this kind of celestial light coming through as if you know it's God's favor shining through the blackness to show that on this field of sacrifice, I understand why it is happening, you know, and I'm, kind of, and I'm with the allies on this, that there's almost a kind of beatific light that comes through the agony and misery of the Zonnebecke, um battlefield. And then he has another little go, he touches up a little bit more, um, and then you get this remarkable final effect. Now, in the end, um, Hurley is basically going to say to Bean, my photographs are going to be seen, they are going to be exhibited and the authority I have is when I talk to our guys coming out of the lines and I give them, you know, a quick um, uh, run through of, of the snaps that I've got and what I've created. They all say, you know, good on your son. That's what's to be shown. So he takes his authority from Australian soldiers and he says these things are going to be shown. Really, Bean wants to block him. He doesn't want these. And, and, and Hurley has to use all of his um, all of his ego, all of his connections to, to get his way. And, and of course, as I'm sure a lot of you know, you know, they will part company and Hurley is going to go off to the um, to the Palestine front to cover the Australians there because he just can't take the atmosphere anymore and will move on. Now, the way people are accessing this, as I said, if you can't get to the actual exhibitions is through the illustrated uh, press. And um, as I also mentioned, you know, the Canadians for a, a big chunk of the war are leading the way because they're shoving things through their censorship um, processes much more quickly than um, the Brits. And the only thing, um, uh, you know, Aiken stroke Beaverbrook is, is very savvy about this. He says, yeah, 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 you know, there's no problem, surely. You know, um, one of the Dominion governments has passed them. You can put them in the London press all I ask, and here's the coming bit, is that you say the photographs come courtesy of the Canadian War Records Office. So he also knows you know, he's bigging up Canada um, in this war. This is a Canadian record, so you're probably looking at Canadian troops, um, and you know he's doing a, a really good job selling Canada. Um, so here, you know, you, you get um, Illustrated London News, Daily Mirror, showing the same, exactly the same photographs on um, their, their front page um, as we move through um, uh, Third Eep. Um, there, you can see the photographs are proving the victory. Remember, as we all know, as, as a Third Eep is, is dragging on and on and there aren't any great dramatic moves forward of the line you know so you can't show a nice map and you know the line has gone way over here there is nothing like that that can be shown but what you can do is show you know that this erosion of the enemy's position and that nothing the enemy does can actually stop us and notice as well that the true enemy becomes not the skill of the Germans as defenders, you know, and, and it's certainly not the true enemy is anything duff about our operational approach, you know, or, or British strategy. It's the weather. So that the the army that you're fighting, the true enemy that you're fighting in the autumn of 1917 is not the Germans, because on a man to man basis, you know, the Hun can't stop us. It's when the weather is going from. So the complete rout of General Mud, you see there. Moving forward in the West, a wrecked pillbox. So, you know, even when the Germans have constructed their, their new seemingly impregnable defensive uh, positions, we can um, deal with them. Um, and again, 
you know, the idea that the home front does not know what the battlefront looks like is disproved. You can see from that picture the complete route of General Mudd, the hideousness of conditions at the front is there in the face. Um, and there, what's being fought through, a lot of hopes unfulfilled, the failure of the pillboxes, you know, and, and to see a pillbox kind of sinking like a, a ruined ship um, into the mud there um, is, is doing two things at once, isn't it? A, that the, the Germans can be, you know, cracked, but also, you know, the effect that must be created on people's minds, what must the front be like, you know, if, if a pillbox begins to roll over and sink as well? Yes, that's partly to do with, with the power and the accuracy of British artillery, but what must the front be like, you know, if, if the concrete cannot be held by the ground, if it's slipping into it? But it is the photographic proof of victory in that very dull, you know, very trying autumn into the winter of 1917. And as I've also said, you know, that thanks to that ability to caption things, thanks to the ability to put words onto the pictures, to control the way people interpret the image, what you can do is turn the hideous reality of war into a bit of a lark. So, you know, here's Ryder Ryder's very famous photographs, you know, of the Canadian machine gunners in their positions. Um, you know, in, in front of Passchendaele village, just occupying shell holes. So there you can see, there, there it's obvious, isn't it, to the viewer? There aren't even proper trenches the other side of Passchendaele village. It is just shell holes they're living in, and they must be flooded like the ones that are next to them. But what does the Daily Mirror call it? It reduces it all to a great British outdoor boy scouting lark, doesn't it? A dog's life at Passchendaele. Now that I mean that that's obviously tongue in cheek, you know, and it and it mentions Bruce Bairnfather. They wish they had a better role. So the Bairns father, you know, the, the kind of larrikinism, the laid back, phlegmatic working class culture of um of old Bill and, and Bert just kind of uh, phlegmatically, stoically getting on with this, with their wry sense of humour. That's, there's the photograph, the indexical reality of life at the front, but given an entirely new spin by, um, by what's written. And also photography can help with uh, distractions from passion out. Rider, Rider's beautiful one there, you know, of, of, um, of the soldiers with the, the local girls um, in uh, Belgium starting to, uh, in the last stages of the harvest. Now, again, in fact, they're Rider, Rider's um, sort of a driver and orderly. So they're not kind of, you know, Canadian soldiers or any other soldier that just happened to have strolled past and had sat themselves down with a couple of pretty girls because they fancied a bit of flirting. He has posed that. But that that um, sense of, of giving people a distraction, uh, you know, from the diet of the front while still showing them what life is like in France. You know, so it's not um, it's not all the pain and misery of the front. You know, our, our and our soldiers retain their humour. And um, of course, our allies are, 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 are really grateful for them being there and they get a little bit of distraction you know Tommy gets a bit of distraction because he will do a little bit of um flirting and and, and, and the girls uh, sort of enjoy uh, uh the jokes and they partake of that um and and so you get um that that sense of of the life behind the lines there and as I mentioned the Australians want to get in on the act so there's Frank Hurley, um, uh, his photographs. Interestingly, um, the Australian government is and, and being a really obsessed with that image of the band marching through that Um, You know, in some ways, not the most fabulous or arresting of war photographs, um, but I think it shows you, you know, particularly what. Bean and Co are interested in Australian armies marching like the you know the ancient armies of Europe, almost like the conquering armies of Rome. You know, a triumphal parade through the ground that they have captured um, and into a French town where the locals, you know, in your dreams, can start to return and be grateful. Um, for their their liberation, so really interesting that the um, uh, uh, Australian government you know, was so intent on using that as, as the centerpiece of their exhibition, the the, the triumphal march into um, into uh, uh, Bapom there. Um, 
And in terms, uh, one of its other um, great I images um, that Hurley takes is, of course, this fascinating um, uh, uh, image and this wonderful image of, of the guys in the hut just behind the lines, um, uh, which is also uh, titled How I Did It. Um, and, and, and look at the juxtaposition, that wonderful juxtaposition that the Daily Mirror's um, a photo editor has done there. Underneath, you get the reality of the front and all of those guys, you know, hauling on the guy rope, trying to drag the artillery piece through the mud. Exactly what Jagger is going to pick up on and the Royal Artillery Memorial, isn't it? You know, that, that sense of the physical activity that the front demands. So the reality of the front and then the, the juxtaposition of the, the jokes, the larks behind the lines, the BSing even that goes on behind the lines. So how I did it, that, that's obviously quite tongue in cheek. You know, so you've got this guy who's keeping his audience spellbound, but the, the obvious in the narrative of that photograph is, are they saying, we all know he's making this up. We all know he's exaggerating about what he did. And we're sort of treating it as a bit of a comedy act. And we're enthralled because he's got the gift of the gab, you know, and, and he, he can take us through uh, these uh, series of anecdotes. So um, that, that say that lovely thing of the spirit of the ordinary soldier, that the light heartedness, the jokiness being juxtaposed with the physical hard reality of life at the front in just the way those two photographs um, are put together. So there we are. Um, let joy be unconfined. Connolly has, has, has reached the end of another one. You, know, you, you can be grateful now and put the kettle on and, and think I can get my evening back. Um, I hope what you've seen there is you know, that, that say photographs become, I think, a crucial way of linking home and battlefront. They become a crucial way of uh, providing the home front with a sense of the realities of uh, the fighting front. But that doesn't stop them being manipulated being mucked around with, often by the photographer themselves, but not necessarily mucked around with, you know, for the idea of telling lies. Ironically, they are tampered with in order to try and get somewhere closer to the truth. And then, you know, the combination of that and the words that might be put alongside them give a really potent narrative of the war to people of all ages and all classes um, across the empire and I think have a, a massive lasting effect on the way the war is understood. So I'll shut up there. Thank you all very much for uh, listening um, and um, happy to take any questions. Mark, thanks ever so much indeed. That was absolutely splendid, a real tour de force. We've got already stacks of questions. I Ooh. have a hot, hot night for questions here. So, so I'm going to ask a couple of questions whilst to get others lined up from mm. those who don't have cameras or, or voice um, equipment on their kit. So Steve Mason asks, um, were German photographs perhaps accessed via neutral companies, countries used as examples of what we were fighting against or uh, the claimed atrocities? So in other words, were, were any German photographs uh, at all used in this kind of um, routine? Yeah, uh, relatively few. I mean, as you say, that they do, they are um, uh, brought forward by, um, through the neutral countries, particularly through uh, Switzerland and um, uh, the Netherlands. They tend, when they are used, um, it's almost for um, kind of pantomime effects of um, uh, propaganda. You know, here is the dreadful Hun grinning because he's just you know enslaved another village in Galicia or whatever it is so you you will get them um uh, used uh, occasionally not half as much as as you um might think um of course the, the problem is if they can't get hold of something like a good quality negative or print of it it's very hard to reproduce it and if often you know what's happening is it will be the um, embassies that are picking up newspaper copies of the things you know, rather than um, uh, originals. So trying to use um, uh, German photographic images could be quite difficult. Um, where they're much more successful is when um, uh, a copy of the German U-boat film, you know, the Magic Circle, 
is captured because they then use um, big sections of that, you know, and put in separate end titles, add stuff um, to it to put their own spin on it. So that is, it's an amazing film, The Magic Circle, well worth uh, seeing a uh, lauding German U-boat campaign in the Mediterranean. Um, so, yeah, when they can get hold of a good quality image, they tend to use it, say, but it's, it, it can be really quite um, unsophisticated. You know, it's quite pantomime-ish the way it's used. Tremendous. Thanks very much. Um, I'm just um, trying to cope with an absolute tsunami of questions <laughs> coming in. So um, we've got a few um, questions on, on, on the colourised images. So I'm yeah. going to ask Angela Hall to, to ask one question, which encapsulates quite a few questions mm -hmm. about colourised images. Mm -hmm. Angela, over to you. Oh, thank you. Thanks for a great talk. It was really oh, interesting. Um, yes, I just I noticed in the... Um, sort of the some of the posters for the exhibitions it mentioned mm. colored photographs yes i just yeah. wondered where, when they started and how mm. realistic were the yeah. photographs yeah well you know um prior to um the war a few very early um patented um color film techniques or uh, essentially that they're, they're tinting techniques you know you add to the original negative um uh, uh, starting to be commercially used Ponting uses a few in Antarctica, particularly when he's trying to get the southern lights and things like that. Um, they tend to bring out um, reds and greens quite effectively, but not much else. Um, mm -hmm. So that they're using a few you know, where, where the negative can kind of take it for extra dramatic effects. Others, they're doing the old, you know, what had already become the established technique of essentially hand colorization, which, which had been used. Um, um, the postcard industry you know, is quite mm -hmm. onto that before the war so it, it tends to be a, a relatively narrow palette but um they have worked out you know that that's even more powerful you know you know, just just as peter jackson you know, worked out the colorizing um grabs people's attention all the more um mm -hmm. uh and they do realize that occasionally that's worth it because as we know you know the great war is literally steepier in every sense, you know, the landscape of the Western Front is continually seepier. It lends mm. itself to seepiness. So, if you want to break that up, a, a, a little bit of colorization, they, they think, does um, uh, help. Some of the midsummer ones are done like that, you know. So, you know, that they can get the flowers out and, and, and just to give it that that splash that that um, that drags the eye and the attention. So, it's being done on a limited um, scale. But yeah, it certainly does grab people's um, it, it, attention. You know, it works. Um, but say there are two techniques. One is the old fashioned colorizing and one is using the fairly newfangled techniques, um, uh, which had come in just before the war, but tend to be quite expensive and used on, on a fairly limited scale. Yeah. OK, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that, Angela. Um, next, first up, Gordon. Gordon, do you want to unmute yourself there? Thank you, David. Thank you, Mark. Excellent presentation. I really enjoyed it. There appears to be a lot of post photographs going back. Um, the real deal, the, the photographs of the, the minutiae, the real thing that's going on, would that not get published? That's know? right. Yeah, that yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and so some of you might have. Uh, I mean, you know, these photographers are often taking a um, pretty comprehensive photographic record knowing that there's no way this is going to be shown during the war but they're mm. partly doing it you know for shall we say a, a faithful historical record that one day um you know everyone's going to want to see these now some of you might have come across that um a, amazingly um a, arresting and sobering book that the express puts out what is it in 1934 covenants with death um, which is part of that whole express, um, you know, peace stroke appeasement is the bad side of it, um, uh, campaign of the 1930s. And that is a, a, a collection of um, official photographs, you know, often which have been reproduced in tons of histories. Then it reaches a page saying, do not turn this page if you're of a nervous disposition if you're a child parents you know, do not let children in. we're going to show you the rest of the record now the realities of war 
Mm. And hell's bells. You know, it's still sobering today in a world where we've got used to sort of blood and guts and everything else. They're horrible, some of these images. Right. Yeah. Really I've, seen, I've yeah. actually seen some on, on yeah. you know, over in France, some of the, mu yes. some of the museums you go into. In yeah, the absolutely. Sanctuary World, the, what the butler saw machines. The French tend to be a little bit more liberal about, you know, what, what is shown. You know, so if you look at things like Le Miroir during the war, they show, you know, the famous one of the poilu blown into the trees. That's on their front cover where he's hanging. Now, I think yes. that's partly as well to do with the fact that the war is on French territory. You know, so for the French, this is more of a war of obvious national survival you know, and of national um, uh, uh, violation. So showing the true hideousness, you know, showing that the, the true violation of France and what its population is going through, they're that little bit less squeamish, you know, than the Anglo-Saxons are uh, about it. So it, it's there, um, you know, just as in fact, um, uh, as we know, that the Germans will end up taking some, and so will the Austrians, some pretty nasty photographs, you know, particularly into Serbia when they're hanging local people and such like, you know, and they're recording that in, in quite vivid detail, they're making photographic records um, uh, of it. So yeah, during the war, you, you are seeing these guys creating a, a massive I mean, you've only got to look, haven't you? The Imperial War Museum's Q collection, yes. the series, to know how many are taken. But you do tend to, to, to see, shall we say, a fairly well curated standard album that gets mm. circulated again and again, often in slightly different formats and in slightly different sizes uh, during the course of the war. And it's only going to be post-war um, yeah. that, the, that the depth and the breadth of that is truly uh, exposed to the public. It has to be said, though, that the, the, the people that were there, the, these photographers were there on the behalf of their newspapers. They were looking for copy. Absolutely, yes. Um, documented history. Yes. Um, I mean, they did, to be honest, it's a fabricated photographs. They didn't even have to go. No, no, and um, obviously everything will have to be um, say put, put down for, for censorship. And that's where you do get that ludicrous situation, which a lot of Fleet Street editors, you know, are saying to the, the Ministry of Information, why are you sitting on exactly the same image, which a week ago, you know, Canada House cleared? Mm. Now, this is madness. You know, we, we can put it in. So synchronise this, you know, get it, get it moving a bit more quickly. And, and of course... That's why Beaverbrook is so keen on becoming the Minister for Information. You know, and he said, we, we, we are, we're going to cut through some of this. People want to see, they want to see it quickly. We're going to get these images out there. And, and, and so he's running, you know, he's essentially running the Canadian um, office and uh, the, the British national effort at exactly the same time by the spring of 1918. Right, thank you for that. I think we best call it a draws now because you could get three hours out of this. Out of <laughs> you and, uh, we, we, okay, thank I you, mean, David. Three hours thank gone. Again, <laughs> right, okay. Next, thanks for that, Gordon. Um, Kate Walker, Kate, um, fire away. Thank you, David. Um, Professor Connolly, do we know if any of the photographs especially the the super sized ones were archived anywhere um mm. they must have been extraordinarily expensive and difficult to produce i just wondered if, we, if they've survived a, a, a few have um the uh the, the big problem as you as you've uh, pointed out there uh, Kate, is, is is um archiving them you know because where can you store them um, and, and particularly you know so for the imperial war museum once it's taking on the art collection you know and that takes up rack after rack after rack, and, and, and of course even by their by their shall we say compared with today's standards they know that these things need to be conserved in a certain way um and, and so conservation you know the right kind of atmospheric um conditions in which to store these paintings is possessing them then there are these photographs and really a bit of the, the curatorial mindset is, well, do you know what, if it came to it, we can replicate the photograph at this scale from the negatives, but the painting, you can't. You know, so the painting gets the huge rack space in, in the proper store. The photographs tend to be left out. That means uh, they become much more susceptible to damp and mold and even rodent, um, you know, nibbling away 
at them. So um, uh, the Australians have certainly found uh, a few during the course of the centenary and started work on uh, some conservation work on them. They have been uh, reproduced. Um, uh, of course, what tends to happen now is um, there's no one sees any point in actually printing them anymore when you can project them at the original scale. So often that was used, you know, and particularly during the centenary, I think in, in uh, at the Australian War Memorial, you know, they, they simply projected them on the scale that they would have been seen at rather than you know, reproduce it in, in canvas. Yeah, so um, uh, a lot of them were lost over time. They were put into stores. They weren't stored particularly well. As we know, um, you know, a lot of the, the British collection when it was stored at the Crystal Palace, um, it was appalling, you know, because that obviously wasn't built at anything like uh, archival storage conditions. So um, even there, you know, where a lot of the big kits, so I'm, I'm going off on a slight tangent here, but you know, like the big guns and such, like they're just leaving out in the gardens at Crystal Palace. And by the time it comes to, to moving them, you know, they, they drag some of them and basically they fall apart with rust. You know, these things just like collapse in on themselves because they haven't been repainted. You know, they have, they've had none of the maintenance that would have happened. Um, so, um, yeah, the, 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 the supersized photographs, I'm afraid, are a, um, are a victim of their scale and the inability to conserve them easily, particularly as against the rival claim of um of painted canvas which is treated as a one-off where there is the idea that if need be you know you could replicate these thank you thanks for your question there kate right i'm just going to hop now out of order to trevor adams because trevor's question sort of follows on from from that one trevor do you want to just fire a new question hi, yeah hi mark thank you for the talk that was brill thank you uh, i used to do a lot of um, amateur sports photography in my youth. All oh, right. And the stuff, the thing that always crosses my mind, I want your comments on it, please. Looking at this era, they didn't mm. have telephoto lenses. Oh. So you can't get close, so you do static mm. stuff. Mm. Got very slow film stock, mm. too fast shutter speeds. Yeah. Uh, so action is, if not impossible, very difficult. There's mm. actually one photograph of the retreat from Mons where it's obviously been shelled as he was taking it mm. for real because the people are blurred because they're running yes. like, out of the shelling. Mm -hmm. um, mm. But there was just a, just a comment. It amuses the heck out of me, the photograph like that with Vimy, supposedly of the attack. Where's the photographer? It yeah, has to exactly. be no man's land. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A plate camera and a black cloth and a tripod. Exactly. exactly. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Say cheese. Look at the birdie. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. <laughs> That's, uh, and, and, and of course, that's exactly what people like, you know, Malins and McDowell in the in the kinematograph unit, when it comes to um, filming an attack, you know, when you've got a, um, a 12 pound camera, you know, which has to be cranked at a certain speed and very rhythmically and a six pound tripod, of course, you can't get the moment of the attack. You know, he has to fake that behind the lines because he can't say um, places again, please, loves. You know, if everybody's happy, uh, he, he can't do that. You know? So so that's why we get this weirdness often, you know, in, in uh, what we might call the actuality visual record. And you certainly see it in the Somme film, don't you, that you get this narrative that's all about preparation for the attack because that can be done. You know, the ammunition coming up, the men coming up, the guns firing. You then get a very, very, very brief attack sequence, and then it's all post-attack. It's the post-facto element of fighting. It's the wounded coming in to Minden Post or whatever it is, you know, or being evacuated. It's the prisoners being brought in because none of them can actually capture in this day and age at this point the reality of combat. And, and, that's, and that's where Hurley's coming at it. He's saying, look, I've got you know, hundreds of, of snaps of bits and bobs. Um, and if you look, you know, on one half of this image is great, but the other half, you know, it's there, nothing's happening. So it's only when I put them together, do I get something that in my mind's eye was like that moment when I shoved my head 
over the parapet you know and and say and and, and at times Bean simply isn't picking up that that subtlety he's kind of almost saying well if it can't be done technically it shouldn't be done at all uh, and you know Hurley saying stroll on pal yeah we're not having that no 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 um uh, you know and, and besides as, as Hurley knows um my reputation and therefore what I'm going to earn after the war is based uh, uh upon this so uh the composite image comes in Thanks very much. Thanks very much for, for, for your question there, Trevor. Bill, Bill Twist, do you want to just um, fire in your question? Uh, thank you, David. Yes, Mark, a great pitch, and, and, thank, and you. thank you very much. My question really relates back to one, I suppose, that Gordon asked about three iterations ago. Where is the censorship coming from that prevents or, or uh, discourages or doesn't even display the photographer's output of you know the gritty realism i've yeah. got some photographs of bodies but we've got none of the of the horrible mutilation of the mm. human flesh and there are That's none true. of mental anguish yeah which i yeah. think was probably still there in the second world war but had gone yeah. 50 years yeah. later in the 60s and 70s yeah who, who is it who's censoring the stuff yeah uh, well uh, and and this you know is part of that whole um wider concept of the home front which is one of self mobilization really you know um fleet street to a large extent censors itself you know because it, obviously it wants to remain the right side of the defense of the realm act you know once newspaper editors um uh, and this is why you see don't you 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 can kind of play that little experiment uh, if you look at the um the difference between the British daily press and the British regional press during 1915 and into 1916, you can see that the big Fleet Street daily London newspapers, because they've got teams of solicitors, you know, and legal officers, work out the full implications of Dora and want to stay the right side of it because, you know, frankly, um, the financial repercussions of falling foul of it could be appalling. When you go out to some of the provincial press, even though it ultimately might be part of one of the, you know, bigger stables where that isn't that knowledge, you know, that's why you get, don't you, you're like well into 1916, you know, the editor saying, um, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, you know, of the tiny village down the road, their son who is at the front has just sent home a letter. And we thought you, our readers, might like to, to um, find out, you know, what it's like. And they will reprint it verbatim even though, strictly speaking, that breaks Dora. And I think that's partly because they, they literally are, are not up enough, you know, on the regulations. So Fleet Street, because time is everything, you know, and the production circuit is everything, they want the war office, they want to put stuff in front of the war office and say, oh, we're all right with this one, right? We want to run with this one. Um, and they want the war office to say, yep, fine, straight away, bang, that's fine. In it goes. So they're to a large extent censoring themselves. They're trying to make it easy for the war office. So they read all the regulations, you know, and occasionally the war office will step in and make its uh, position slightly more clear. But it's very much a coalition of interest between the war office and um, the, the newspaper editors and the proprietors themselves because of the nature of the business they really don't want to do anything that might result in friction because it's just uh disastrous for the business model so that, that you know yeah that really is um uh, where it's coming from. And, and exactly the same will happen in um the second world war you know which is why in both world wars the ministry of information can kind of say fairly hand on heart we don't really run censorship well kind of yes you do but you don't have to use a massive mallet on it because most of the time you know the press agencies are actually doing the job for you they don't force you to drag out your big guns you know your big guidelines that you can use because they want to stay um uh, the right side of it in order to make sure um that the the newspaper is printed and of course in the second world war what's going to be even more important because the production scales are so tight are newsreels 
you know, where you've got to get a, a film printed, you've got to get multiple copies made, you've got to distribute it across the country. The newsreel companies simply cannot afford any kind of hold up. So they are very closely working with all of the service ministries to make sure everything is OK, meet what they, uh, the military centre will be happy with. Um, you know, uh, famously, uh, of, of course, where, where censorship and visual imagery uh, are really going to crash into each other is in CRW Nevinson's great um, war art exhibition, at the Leicester Galleries in Leicester Square, when guns um, is exhibited in, in uh, 19... 17 you know and, and there's Nevinson's one of his most famous paintings you know, which is of the dead British soldier in the trench lying in the bottom of the trench and uh, Captain Lee the censor at the war office who's basically ended up in that job because he's been invalided home and he's pretty much saying to his bosses you know I know nothing about art what's expected about please don't make me the art censor please 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 don't make me the art censor you know and in that great army way you're the art censor they make sure he's the art censor so he says to Nevinson, you can't show dead British soldiers. You can't show a dead British soldier. I'm Nevinson saying, I'm like, come on, what are you talking about? I, I was at the front. I know they die. Everybody knows they die. So he says to the Leicester galleries, we're still going to exhibit it, right? But he then puts a big bit of brown parcel paper through the middle of the, the painting. So it covers the corpse. And he writes censored on it. And, and of course, everyone queues around the block then, don't they? Because it's the world's worst thing. Everybody wants to see the censored photograph. And it will tell you something, how Britain, shall we say, is a confused liberal with a small L um, state at war, that that is allowed to happen. So people queue up to see the censored painting with, with his word censored through the middle of it. Yeah, I, say, I think you really see a, a kind of world that's groping towards the rules for total war, how you play it, you know, when you've overstepped the mark, what's the right way of doing it. But essentially, I think they're all working with each other. And sorry, I went off on a massive tangent um, there. And you do really have to give me a clip around the ear or you know, push me back onto the straight and narrow. No, we won't do that because we just like you to, 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 to run with it. That, that's <laughs> fine. Um, Bill, thanks for your question. I'm going to interject with a question from somebody who's got, not got a camera, which nicely uh, dovetails in, into Bill's question. Br Brian Matthews asks, um, did the photographers have any input on the text that accompanied the, their, public, uh, their, their work? Uh, very rarely, um, in fact, because um, I said, you know, the, the role of the photo editor had really emerged by 1914. Sometimes they make suggestions where you tend to see it as if they're um, post-war, you know, when they're writing their, their memoirs and sometimes there are a kind of private exhibitions, then they have a bit more control. Sometimes they will make suggestions as to what goes with it, but that is pretty much you know uh the, the newspaper editor and the photo editors um uh call as as to what go with it now because uh you know at, at places like the mirror as you saw because so many of the photographers are from the mirror you know the photo editor and the photographers know each other anyway they kind of know each other's styles they know when they want to be tongue-in-cheek when they want to be serious so they, there's a kind of simpatico uh there that they're not really straying um much beyond um what the photographer might like to say Hurley uh, because of his reputation you know he, he's uh, uh, a lot more forward in suggesting titles in suggesting words that will um, go with it but um, as I said they 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 um, they can give suggestions but they don't generally dictate but there is that that kind of relationship with, with the with the home front team um, that, that gives it the kind of spin that the, all, all sides are happy with. Perfect, thanks. Right, next up, David Taft. David, you should unmute yourself there. Thank you very much for uh, an excellent presentation. Thank it's you. very professional. Um, this Zoom business just gets better by the week. It's absolutely incredible. Um, my question, I don't even know if it can be answered properly. <laughs> Given that we've grown up with images, uh, in our life, etc., and what have you, and the power of them, and how they're all encompassing today. Mm -hmm. Why is it so much attention is paid to war poets, but not war photographers? 
I'd be told mm. if I wanted to know about the war, go and read some war poetry. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that, that's a really uh, fascinating one. I, I, I think um, it's partly, you might say, academic snobberies, isn't it? Um, you know, that, that literature is always regarded as a higher form of art, you know, and, and has more weight to it. I think um, the, the, the moving and the photographic image has only slowly caught up with that degree of gravitas. You know, we, we have to remember that something like um, the kinematograph, you know, immediately before the Great War, is pretty much regarded as something akin to a circus act. You know, it, it's what the lower classes have chucked in front of them to keep them entertained and sort of bread and circuses for them. And it's really only uh, in the First World War and the Great War where we begin to make the the transformation um, of, of the moving image because, um, you know, people who before the war who might have seen the moving image as very much something that, that entertains the great unwashed can suddenly justify going to the cinema because they say, oh, I only go for the topicals, you know, I only go for the newsrooms because I want to see what's happening in the war news. You know, it's a bit like that Victoria Wood joke about kind of, you know, upper middle class people that say they only have a television so they can watch David Attenborough documentaries but really they're secretly watching Coronation Street on the side they just don't want their neighbours to know um, and, um, whereas I think uh, photography what was certainly um, uh, emerging earlier as an art form people like Julia Margaret Cameron um, and such like but the, the, the problem I think um, uh, as far as as, as as kind of wider British society goes and then finding out is um, so, you know, how do you write about it how do you, uh, and in particularly if you're going to teach, you know, um, students at any age, how do you get them to write about? How do you write an essay about a photograph? Whereas there is, you know, a much bigger weight of, of tradition and uh, discursive um, uh, techniques and knowledge about how you deal with literature. So I think it's taken uh, film and photography, you know, quite a while to um, to catch up and, and be given um, uh, given the um, respect that they deserve. And of course, as I've also mentioned, the big, big, big problem um, that you've had with photography and film almost from the start is because the image is so easy to manipulate, how do you know you are dealing with something genuine? Now, whereas once a poem is published and has got the poet's imprimatur on it, you know, and it has been through a publisher's hands, and that is the final product, you always have, with the kind of malleability of photographs and film, you know, and particularly as we know now with you know with, with with our new appalling war that's going on and the manipulation, you know, how do you know that this has any kind of authenticity to it? So I think there's some intellectual snobberies. There are um, different academic and intellectual traditions um, going on here. Um, that has meant that I, I think a lot of people in. Uh, I think the irony is. Um, you know, I, I presume I've always thought that probably a lot of people are like me, that as soon as they begin to read war poems, what they start to see in their head are kaleidoscopes of these images that, in fact, they're almost symbiotic. You know, the, 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 the written word and the um, image official or otherwise um, is, is intrinsically linked to the written word now. Thank you. Oh. That's certainly given me something to think about. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, thanks for your question there, David. Right. OK, we're running rapidly out of time, so I'm just going to um, grab a couple of questions from Ooh. those who have not got um, um, uh, cameras. So Edwin Astell has asked, in the early days of the war, many officers had cameras and took photos. Mm. Were any of these circulated publicly? And that's from Edwin. Uh, yes, you will see um, a, a few in um, the early days of the war will crop up in uh, the, the press um, and early uh, publications. And I think what's happening there is largely because um, I, I don't think there's kind of much malice of thoughtful is that no one really has a clue in the first six months or so of the war what 
the actual censorship procedures and guidelines are you know so stuff is is, is getting out you've only got to look um in january and february 1915 with how many images there are of the christmas truce you know the daily mirror is full of them all of those unofficial ones that where the officers and men with their um you know kodak um vest pocket um yeah. uh, ca cameras are, are, are snapping and some as we know with the drums you look, uh, that's probably the, the kind of highlight of, of that, what we might call unofficial photography moment, having its blaze of glory in the press. It is that reaction to, to the Christmas truce. So, so those images are out there and circulating, you know, and, as, and I think particularly those Christmas truce ones have become some of the most poignant, you know, and iconic um, of the war. So they are there. And there is an example, I've just pulled it up here, uh, of the photograph of by Private Fife um, of the Liverpool... Um, oh, yeah. ...at uh, 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 Bella Wired. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, that, the, guy, the guy was a, um, um, a, a, a journalist. Um, yes, so, yeah. So we've, we've got this, uh, this yeah. article on the, on the Western amazing. Association website, which is... Yeah. That's, these are... Um, composite yeah. um i think this one's a composite of, of yeah. several photographs yeah yeah that, i mean i always find that image absolutely amazing you know that men in in, in the heat uh, of battle uh there that that is a, a truly remarkable photograph that one yeah yeah so uh yeah that's uh that's that's um mm. that's that let's have a look at the next question um Andy Johnson, slightly technical question here from Andy. In the Midlands, we know that the best First World War photographer is David McClellan, mm -hmm. um, Bridge and Six North Midland Division. Apart from Jane Carmichael's book on uh, First World War photographers, do you know of any other books covering the life and works of McClellan? Uh, no, uh, and that's a really interesting lacuna. Um, there's there's some um I'm, I'm trying to think i don't think um it focuses on uh, um uh, mcclellan but there's a very I, I will um send it on to you dave there's there's a couple of very interesting articles um uh, one by martin jolly um uh, there's a, some very good stuff about the Canadian War Records Office and its approach to photography. But that's right. I, I've not seen anything um, that's solely about McClellan. But the stuff that I do know about, I will certainly circulate. Um, yeah, because McClellan is there, you know, sometimes gets mentioned in passing. Sometimes there's a little bit more about him. Um, but um, I've not seen anything specifically about him in my researches. No, that, that's real. We're virtually out of time, so I'm just going to fire in one, one, one point here, which is mm. one that's actually bugging me as well. Uh, it's a question from Dave. Sorry, I don't know Dave's surname, but D Dave has said it, it's worth pointing out how big the negatives must have been and how good the resolution must have been to blow it up wall size. I mean, yeah. I, I know we can digitally manipulate photographs these mm. days. But you can't blow something up to a super size when, yeah. when the resolution isn't too great. So how on earth did, did the do those supersized wall hangings? Yeah, yeah. I, I, mean, I do not know enough about the, the, the um, kind of technical side of photography. Yeah, some but, but, yeah. but my admiration for it, as you say, th their, their skills, their ability to get that and, and to have something that we can see, you know, from the rest of the photographic record was was clearly, you know, sharp enough and powerful enough and, and wasn't some sort of, you know, their version of pixelated um, uh, uh, image that they were showing. I'm, I'm thinking exactly of pixelation, where, where mm. it all bubbles up yeah. and you, you can't make head and the tail of it. Mm. Very final question from Simon uh, Phillips, who has, um, says, uh, you've mentioned Jeffrey Mallins and Ernest Brooks. Mm. Did cinematographers and photographers work together at times? It's an interesting question that I'll let you answer that one because yeah. I, I've come across uh, the juxtaposition of, of, of those two individuals in 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 a couple of things but anyway just fire away yes yeah yeah it, it's certainly true that I, I think i'm right in saying that Ivor castle is hanging around at times with malins that that must have been interesting because you get the impression there's some pretty two pretty big egos there um and there is a a slight sense of um uh where one is going the other one 
is going to follow because they're all looking for a story you know and if someone's got a lead if someone knows that something is going to happen um that they will uh, be with each other and and of course at times um because they are also being um you know tipped off by the the press handlers from ghq that want certain things concentrated on um you know that, that want something for, for the record they're also going to take them to places where they know they will get a good shot you know where, where they will be saying that they're going to be marching past this sunken road in a minute you know and you're perfectly safe you can get up there on the embankment you'll get the shot that you want um so yes it's it's clear at times that the the, the cinematographers and uh, the still photographers are in the, the same vicinity and pretty much you know uh, working uh, cheap by jowl on, on that, what I've pulled up on the screen here is an exact example of that. What, what we've got here is a screenshot from an IWM um, short short reel um, mm. showing Brooks actually mm. setting up um, a, a photograph. So, so we've got the cinematographer taking a moving picture, mm. that captures Brooks mm. setting up mm. um, and that, that particular image there. Yeah. And I, I think that juxtaposition there of, of, of the two working mm -hmm. side by side is um, mm -hmm. fascinating. Right, that's that. Let me kill that. Um, we've run out of time. It's half past nine. It's after half past nine. And I always say we'll stop at half nine. Ladies and gentlemen, I thoroughly enjoyed this evening, and I'm sure everybody else has who's watched this. We've had an absolute, uh, as I say, tsunami of questions. I apologise to those who we've not got around to answering. Um, can we just do another very quick uh, round of applause for Mark uh, for his um, sure. work, work, work tonight uh, with via the, the the hands up routine? So so we're, we've got to. Uh, Hundreds of hands going up once again. Um, Mark, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Thank you. Thank you all so much. It's, I know it's you're great a very popular you. speaker, and I'm sure that we'll have Mark back at some future date if you're willing to come back and talk to us. Yeah, well, I will be doing it through the medium of dance then. That's the last <laughs> great challenge for me. <laughs> that, that was a joke that you said at the outset. <laughs> some people <laughs> might have missed it. <laughs> It's pulling everybody's legs, <laughs> I think. Right, <laughs> on, on that note, Mark, sincere thanks. Thank you. Thank thank you very much. Much. Thanks for joining us tonight. And uh, please stay tuned. We'll keep running these for the next uh, few months on a fortnightly basis. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Thank, thank you. you. Good night, everyone. Thanks for coming. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye. Mademoiselle from Armitage's Yeah.